Start recording. Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. You know, uh, yesterday I asked for some people to post in the forums and we didn't get very much posts in the forums, which is okay because maybe no one knows the answers to the question I was asking, but I will say that uh, even just on last night's stream, I, I don't know who it was who originally posted the link to the MIT Open Courseware video that I retweeted on the on the on the tweet stream here. This the, if you if you go to the tweet bot, I retweeted it um, uh, somewhere here. This this right here, uh, this guy. Um, I uh, I thought that was a pretty good lecture. I it was still a little opaque in some parts. But honestly, like, it actually clarified a fair number of things for me on the whole P and P thing and why you often hear people either saying wrong things or saying things that sound conflicting and you're just like, wait a minute, I don't understand. What are we actually saying here? Well, uh, like I said before, I don't want to go into P and P kind of stuff too much because I don't really know anything about it. So it doesn't make any sense for me to talk about it on the stream. But I do like mentioning stuff like this uh, just as sort of asides because I feel like it maybe encourages people to go learn about these things. So I'm just going to briefly say what was on that video uh, and hope that maybe some of you out there will be interested in it and you'll go take a look at it because obviously you can watch that video and it's MIT Open Courseware, so you could then go watch a whole bunch of videos about this. Uh, and maybe get interested in some of the theoretical CS stuff, which is, again, not something we cover on Handmade Hero and not something I know. Um, but, so here was the interesting diagram that he drew in that lecture that I thought uh, was pretty great. And I think I figured out, based on the way he was talking, where one of my biggest confusions about how people talk about things like P and NP came in. And so I'll just briefly say what those were. Uh, again, Please don't take anything I'm about to say as instructive because I am not a theoretical computer science person, so I don't know. Uh, I'm merely telling you what my impression was of this thing. So he drew a pretty cool diagram and it kind of looked like this, uh, where he sort of said like, okay, let's pretend that we just have some notion of how difficult a problem is. And he said, I didn't really want to talk too much about that because in order to get more specific, you had to start using terms that had very specific definitions. And this is just meant to sort of a blanket picture. So he didn't want to say complexity or anything like that. But so he just said difficult, like the problems get harder as we go in this direction. So like the hardest problems would be out here and the easiest problems would be here. Uh, and then he sort of like started like dividing up this line. And what he did was he said like, okay, let's go ahead and talk about where things are uh, in terms of like when we're saying P or NP, what do we mean when, when we're talking about those things? And he drew something that looked basically like this. Uh, he said that P was like from here to here, right? And he's like, you know, uh, NP uh, is, is uh, from here to here. And then he goes like, okay, you know, here is EXP, right? Uh, which was something that I think got mentioned on the chat yesterday. Uh, and then he was like, okay, then here is like R. So he drew this little thing. So already, just having this, this simple diagram, and remember, I, uh, I got confused on last stream, although I, th I think I kind of had this os osmosized and, or diffused into my brain from, because I was kind of thinking about it in a different way. But remember, NP is non-deterministic polynomial time. Uh, and we can talk about that a little bit later, but that's just like, you know, P is definitely polynomial time. We talked about that yesterday. And this is non-deterministic polynomial time. All right, and these, we don't know what they are yet. All right, so uh, the first thing that immediately was kind of clarifying for me when you do this diagram was like, oh, I get it. The reason why you start to get confused when you hear people talk about stuff with P and NP, even if you don't even know what they mean, is because NP is always like thought of as a superset of P, right? So it's not like this is P and this is NP, right? It's like this is P and NP includes all of P in it, right? And so somebody might say that something was in NP even though it was actually polynomial time and they're not wrong. Does that make sense? So like already that was kind of nice to see it drawn so clearly where you're like, oh, these, 
The way that computer scientists chose to break this down, they didn't make the sets exclusive, they made them like inclusive. So it's like polynomial time is some set of algorithms, non-deterministic polynomial time is like a bigger set that includes all of the original set, right? And exp and r and, and keep, keep going uh, out from there. So like, okay, that's, that's really nice. Like that was pretty clarifying and I thought that was pretty good just to start with, okay. Uh, the next thing that he said that was really helpful, I thought, uh, and he kind of didn't say this in the clearest way possible, so I apologize, maybe I misunderstood him, but it seemed, he, he seemed like after he said a bunch of things that kind of like rooted, you know, zeroed in on this, and I, if this is actually the way that computer science uh, theor theory people talk about it, then uh, now I understand why a lot of the things they said weren't making sense before, uh, so this would be pretty great too. And that is, we, we mentioned MP hard and that it always seems to be used weird or used wrong. And like I said on the previous stream, I was like, I don't even know what it means. Like, I don't want to pretend to know. I don't know. Uh, I'll probably just get it wrong. Uh, well, this he sort of clarified as well. And the NP complete thing, which was also kind of annoying. And when you hear people say it and blah, blah, blah. And you never really know what any of this stuff is. Well, he clarified that too, which is pretty great. What he uh, basically said after going through a bunch of things was that hard means basically greater than or equal to, right? And this, the equal to part was the part that always confused me because I thought when they said CS things, they usually meant greater than. So I thought when they would say something like NP hard, what that meant was that it was like outside of NP, like it was to this side of NP, right? It's NP hard, meaning I can't solve it using an NP algorithm, right? That's what I thought they meant. But that's not what they mean. When they say NP hard, they mean greater than or equal to NP, which I which never sunk in for me. So what that means is that like right at this point where you transition from NP to exp, they're actually saying, well, it's either right at that point or this, this direction. So it could still be in NP, but it's definitely not easier than anything in NP. It's not, right, because these problems would, you know, if we imagined that we started breaking up NP problems into some finer discretization of how hard they were, NP hard means that it's at the very end of those problems, but it might still be there, right? So it's greater than or equal to, it might be right there, or it could be out here, right? But it might still be there. So greater than or equal to, that was like a big thing that was like, oh, that's nice, now I get it. When they say that, it makes sense where it lines up. So that's pretty cool. Second great thing from that lecture. Okay, third great thing is finally saying what NP complete actually really means, uh, at least as far as the, um, uh, the part that I thought had always been kind of confusing about it. NP complete doesn't actually mean that something is in NP. That's not what they use that term to mean. Again, uh, assuming that I understood what he was saying in this lecture correctly. Uh, what they actually mean by NP complete is that they have proved both that it is in NP, right? Meaning that, that the first part of what, you know, the part that I would have thought NP complete meant, they have proved that it is in NP. So it's somewhere in here, right? But they have also proved that it is NP hard. Meaning that it has, NP complete means literally this one point right here. So NP complete does not mean that something, like if something was in here, if it was an easier problem in the NP space for whatever that means, and I don't pretend to know. But if it was an easier problem than the hardest problems in NP, it's not NP complete. It's, it may be in NP and it may be not in P, not that we can prove that yet because the whole thing about whether P equals NP, right? These might be the same. Um, but assuming they weren't the same, it might be uh, not in P and it may be in NP, but it might still not be NP complete because if it isn't NP hard, if it's not the hardest type of problem in NP, then you wouldn't call it NP complete, right? Now, again, we don't even know if that's possible. Like, we don't know if it's possible for something to be in NP and not be NP complete. Like, like I don't even know, they didn't cover any of that. So you'd need a real computer science uh, theory guy to start talking about what else, what other possibilities there are. But I really liked that part, because like, oh, okay, I think I get it now. I mean, to the extent that a non-theoretician is going to get it. I think I get it now, what you mean when you say NP complete. You're saying that it's right here. It's as hard as any other problem in NP and it is in MP, so it's not out here, right? And that was kind of solidifying. Okay, so the other things that I thought were good in here 
is he talked about what's outside because that came up on the chat. I asked about that. I was like, what is it called? It, you know, what are the harder things? Are there harder things? Do we know? Blah, blah, blah. And it turns out that we do know a couple things. EXP is exponential time, right? And I, I talked about that, which was like two to the end or whatever, right? EXP is exponential time. R uh, is finite time, which just means it, it, it finishes. Like, like I, it can be solved in, in eons, perhaps, but not an infinite amount of time. It doesn't take an infinite amount of time. And he said, we do have examples of things that are in R, but that are not in any of these. So like this space out here, right, does have problems in it. And he said that there are problems outside of R. So this space out here does. So like the halting problem, which is just given a program, can you tell whether it will ever actually finish or whether it will loop forever? Uh, that problem is, you know, out here, apparently. Again, he just mentioned that kind of offhand in the lecture. And, you know, he said they'd go into that later and whatever. But anyway, uh, so it did kind of answer a bunch of these questions. What he said, uh, and this was sort of what we talked about with the p equals np thing, you know, being a question. Uh, he just basically said, well, you know, we don't know if this region really exists. For all we know, p and np might be the same. So like this might move, you know, all the way out to here someday and we just have that. And then he also seemed to imply, and I don't really know, again, not being a CS theory person, I was like, really? Okay. I mean, you know, I, cool. Uh, he seemed to imply the same was true for NP and exp. He was saying that they, they didn't, it, it's, or at least it sounded like they didn't even really know whether any of this range was actually partitionable. It might be that P just goes all the way out to R and then there's R. So there's just P and R. It, it sounded like that. Uh, but maybe I misinterpreted what he was saying. Uh, again, that's not something I have any idea about. Uh, not a CS person, so no idea. But anyway, uh, at least this stuff was pretty much easier to understand in his lecture than I've ever seen it presented before. So that was pretty great. Uh, it's a really easy lecture to watch. It doesn't require any fancy uh, math or anything. And uh, you know, it, he explains it in a very intuitive way most of, most of the things. Uh, so I thought that was all pretty cool. And so I would highly recommend, if you think any of that's interesting, uh, to go check out that lecture. It's an easy thing to watch. It's fun sometime. Uh, you just put it on and, and check it out. And maybe you'll get interested in some of this stuff. Like I said, it's all pretty interesting. I've never really had time to look into it. That's why I don't know any of it. But that doesn't mean it's not interesting to know. So uh, maybe check it out if it's something that piques your interest. What I will say did not go so well, because that went great. I was like, awesome, that clarifies so many things. Maybe we can avoid making any more nomenclature mistakes on the stream if I ever refer to this stuff, which I don't know that I will. But if I do, uh, that was really great. I think it would help me in the future. Just having this mental picture, it would help me from making stupid mistakes when I'm trying to you know, refer to something, right? Uh, but the thing that did not go so well was traveling salesmen. Um, and so traveling salesmen, I still want, if somebody who somebody who's a serious CS person ever watches the stream and wants to explain this a little bit better, I would love to hear it. So uh, one thing that was clarified and this, I mean, you know, again, I don't really think this is all that relevant, but you know, at least explain some of the confusion is people said, well, the NP part, like obviously uh, these NP things, they only deal with what's called decision problems, right? Uh, and we didn't really talk about that yesterday because, again, it's, it's more CS theory kind of stuff. But a decision problem is just something that returns like true or false, right? It's like bool function of something, right? It's like that's what we're talking about. So the thing can return true or false. That's the only kinds of functions that they talk about when they're trying to talk about NP. Um, you know, why? I don't pretend to know. That's CS theory stuff, like I said. So don't know, but that's what they are talking about. So when they're talking about this class of NP problems, they're talking about things that can be phrased like this. So obviously traveling salesman, the one I referred to when I described it, is find the shortest path, right? It was like a graph theory thing. And we were saying, oh, there's these points in the graph, find the shortest path through them, right? It was like, um, you know, if I've got some network of things here, and basically, I have a series of nodes, like so. And I want to know, I want to visit all the nodes, right? And I, I want to visit all the nodes, and I want to know the shortest route I could take that would visit all the nodes at least once, right? Each node has to get hit. What's the shortest path that would do that, right? And um, 
So what people were saying is, well, the decision version of this is we could, we could turn that into, because if I want to do that, I'd have to return a path, right? I, I can't phrase that as bool f, because if I want to find the shortest path, well, I need to return the path, right? It's a sequence. It's like, oh, we'll start at node 1 and go to node 5 and then 4, right? It has to return some, some string of digits. And a string of digits is not a Boolean, right? Um, and so what they do to turn this into a decision problem is they say, well, okay, in order to turn this into a decision problem, we'll just say, is there a path shorter than some length that I'm going to give you? So I'll say, okay, is there a path that reaches all the nodes that's shorter than length 15? Now that's true or false, right? Definitely true or false. Uh, so now you can phrase it in, in terms of this, but uh, you won't actually um, be able to, you won't have the problem that we talked about yesterday of not being able to verify the path because now you don't have to verify that it's shortest. You just have to verify that it's 15 or less. And you can do that by just walking the path, right? Because one of the things is in this bool, even though they're phrased this way, the answer is still expected to be shown. Meaning you're still, it's still supposed to be able to show you this inside. So what you should be able to do is walk the path add up the values and end up with something less than 15 and verify that you visit all the node once. Obviously we could do that trivially. So we don't have to worry about the problem I talked about yesterday of not having a verifier that runs in polynomial time. So we could do that, right? And so what people were claiming is, well, that means the traveling, the regular traveling salesman problem could easily be considered, uh, you know, NP in terms of how hard it is, because all you have to do is if you have, if you had one of these uh, that told you whether it was, you know, you, you could pass in, is it less than 15 or whatever, right? And it would tell you yes or no. Then what you could do is you could just call that with a binary search on the, you know, the number, right? You could just say, oh, uh, is there one that's less than 4,000? No, yeah, okay. Is there one that's less than 8,000, right? And you could just keep picking numbers in binary search till you found uh, the, the, the thing, and then that number and that path would be the shortest path, okay? What I don't understand about that, though, what I don't understand about that explanation is why I say that I didn't feel like we quite got an explanation about traveling salesmen for the layman, about whether it's actually would be considered NP or not, in the sense that, again, it's not a decision problem, so it can't really be, but how hard is it? Is it exponential or not? Um, the reason that it's a little bit, that's a little unsatisfying to me, is assuming that we've got a cost for each of these routes, you know, like this is five and this is 10 or whatever, right? The person who constructs this graph could just make sure that the weight of the, the, the costs here, uh, you know, if there's n nodes, right, um, in this graph, because this is what we're talking about, the, the complexity of, of this is, you know, O2 to the n currently. We don't, uh, or actually, no, it's, it's factorial, I think, right? I think that's what traveling salesman is. I don't remember, but point being, I think it's n factorial. Uh, point being, if you have n nodes, right, uh, and what you're saying is, well, if we proved P equal to NP, then I could give you a polynomial time algorithm that would tell you whether for a given size, right, whatever that is, uh, whether or not there was a path, then I just binary search. Well, that means there's some polynomial time thing, right? And then it's going to be log, you know, N times that polynomial time. Oh, isn't that in P? Well, the thing that I have a problem of is this N. The n is not the same n here, right? What it's going to be log in is the sum of the route lengths, right? Which is not part of the uh, definition of the original n. The route lengths are just freely settable. So if I wanted to be if if I wanted to be mean, what I would do is I'd set the total route lengths. In fact, I could just set every route length because I'm being very mean. I could just set the, uh, but I could just set the route lengths to be something that adds up to, uh, to, to the, to, to the n, right? Now, just because you take log base two of it, you still end up with a running time, right? You're taking log base two of this value. Well, now you still end up with log base two of two to the two to the n, which, hey, is just two n times p, which is still exponential, right? 
So my feeling is that in order to claim that we would actually be able to solve the traveling salesman time in polynomial time, given that P equaled NP, if someone proved this, someone would have to explain to me how that's actually gonna work when you can, when you can feel free to it seemingly confound that by just setting the route lengths to be sufficiently large that a binary search of them takes 2n time. Now maybe it's just, well, you can be cleverer about how you binary search, like binary search the, the actual breakpoints of the things, but then it assumes that you know how you might traverse the paths, which should be 2n different possible ways. And so I don't know, I am unconvinced. Casey remains unconvinced uh, that if p equals np, then real traveling salesman, not the dis decision problem, but real traveling salesman uh, could be done in p time. So that doesn't mean I think that that's wrong. It just means, because like I said, not a CS theory person, so I have no business saying wrong or not. What I am saying is this explanation didn't convince me. This explanation sounds like it's really just a cop-out and I could still construct problems that make it so you take two to the end time. Because a real solution to the traveling salesman that went in p time would not care what the route lengths are. The route lengths are just numbers that are input to it. But this is very dependent on those route lengths, which introduces a whole other problem. Uh, and so someone would have to say to me, oh, but that problem is also solvable in P. Here's that solution, right? So I'd like to see that before I'm willing to say okay. So traveling salesman still remains a little bit of a nastiness here, but at least we got into why there was confusion because people who are saying it was in MP were talking about the decision problem. They're definitely right about that. Um, because that was mentioned in the lecture. So that's not a question. The question is more just actual traveling salesmen. What's the deal there, right? Uh, so if you are a CS person who ever ends up watching this lecture and wants to do uh, the Handmade Hero community, or at least me, a favor and post what that explanation is, I would love to see it uh, just out of curiosity, because hey, uh, I guess nobody really thinks P will ever be proven equal to NP anyway, so it's largely academic, um, but, uh, so is CS theory. It's largely academic and it's, it's interesting. What can I say? All right. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't make you aggravated. Hopefully that makes you uh, interested in going to watch that lecture uh, because I know I had a great time watching it and I hope that other people will too. Thank you very much to whoever posted it originally. Was it Long Boolean? I don't remember who posted it. On the chat, please um, take credit. Uh, where credit is due for posting that initially. Someone posted on the chat like yesterday uh, and, uh, and I watched it last night and it was great. All right, so let's get back to, to our sorting situation here and the practical part of this, right? Uh, like I said, all the CS theory stuff, the reason I don't know it is because it never really comes up. So I've never really been able to justify going to study it, but the order notation part, the simple part of just figuring out what the scalability is and algorithm is, I really do feel like it comes up a lot. Uh, Tom Forsyth and I had an exchange on Twitter yesterday actually, where he was saying he, he was expecting me to rant about how it wasn't useful. I don't know, I think it is useful. What can I say? My, I love to rant, you know I love to rant. I love to complain about things. Order notation is not one of them. I think it's a great thing. I'm glad that CS theoreticians worked that stuff out. I think about it all the time when I'm doing stuff. If I'm working on something like, oh, that's gonna be N squared, like I think it in my head, and I'm glad uh, that, uh, you know, that that sort of framework had been put in place for me. The other stuff that I don't know, the EXP, the R, that stuff, do I see how I'd ever use that? Not really, but you know, at the same time, like I said, it's all interesting, so that's good. Uh, anyway. And maybe someday it will be, maybe, you know, maybe if I knew it really well, I would be able to use it. You know, you never know. Until you actually know something really well, it's hard to say whether it's going to be practically useful because you don't know it. Um, so that's usually the case with math stuff. When you learn it, you're like, oh, you know what, maybe I could use that. Maybe there's something I could do with that. Uh, so anyway, back to sorting. We talked yesterday very briefly about the fact that our bubble sort was, sort was n squared. And the reason that we were saying that it was n squared was because it takes n passes, right, uh, over n things. Right? We have the, the elements that we're trying to sort, and we have to do n passes over that, right? So n passes times n things is n squared. That was very easy, and we could see it um, directly uh, because actually, I guess I don't have my code up yet. Um, but when we looked at the actual code, 
in handmade code handmade render group when we have our sort here uh, let's see here there it is you can actually just see it here is the outer loop here's the inner loop if i multiply the number of things here it's count uh, times the number of things here count minus one i get count squared minus count uh, which is obviously going to grow at the order of count squared. Now, just in case that confuses people, I know we said it a couple times, I just want to make sure everyone understands. If I say something like the running time of this thing is n squared plus n, why do we then say, oh, it's just n squared? Why do we say that? Where does the n go? Well, the reason is because I only care about the worst case term. Because like I said, you know, n squared looks like this, n looks like that. As soon as I want to only talk about what happens at the limit of this thing, well, this dominates. I don't care how much this is. That's so minor at this point. I don't care. So this plus this is not really my concern, right? I only care about this. So when we do order notation, we're strictly talking about how something scales. We could write this if we wanted to be a little more specific. Nothing wrong with it, but in general, we don't really care. We don't care about this that much because this will dominate as we get out to those those higher numbers, and it just doesn't matter that there's an extra n in there because this is what's going to kill you, right? Um, so again, that's because we're talking about scaling. It's sort of like when you, you know, in math, you let when you try to let things go to infinity, you only care about certain things because other things disappear. It's a little bit like that. You only care about the dominant term when you're talking about scaling, and these other terms that just will never be able to grow that fast. It doesn't matter even if they were, you know, at higher constants or something. It's just not going to matter, right? Um, so. You can see in here that's what we had, uh, and this bubble sort uh, was going to have to take count passes over count minus one things, and that's just too slow, right? Uh, again, if we have a lot of items. Now, why isn't it a problem in our current thing? We don't have enough entities. And that brings us to the first thing that we should really point out here, and that is scaling only matters if you actually scale. Right? And so one of the problems with order notation is that it only really kicks in once you have a lot of items, right? Uh, what it's designed to do is to say, what happens if we want to do these things in bulk, a huge number of them? And it's very good at answering that question. It's not very good at telling you what to do if you don't have very many things. And unfortunately, very many things can differ quite a bit depending on the algorithm. And why does it differ? Well. If you remember, I talked a little bit yesterday about constants. Uh, what I said was that, well, if I want to talk about the order of something execution-wise, I say that there's some constant, right? Maybe I say there's C2, uh, you know, n squared plus C1, n plus C0, right? And what I'm talking about here is like the cost for doing the n squared part of things, right? Whatever that part of the algorithm is, is might be one thing. The cost for doing the linear part might be another. And then there might just be some overhead, right? Some startup cost. It doesn't matter how many things I process, I'm always going to pay it, right? You can imagine this being a very kind of like crude way of talking a little bit about how much it costs to execute something, right? And what you can see from this sort of thing here is that these C's will not matter at all when I let n get very large, right? As n gets very large, right? Billions, trillions, infinity. When it gets very large, only the biggest term will count, right? Only the biggest term. Because it doesn't matter what the c is unless the c is zero, n squared will be so much larger than n by the time we get out to those very large numbers that even if the c1 part, right, was very, uh, very, very, um, uh, uh, even if the C1 part was very, very big and the C2 part was very, very small, so that at the beginning, the n squared term, even though it's a larger term, was getting multiplied by a very small coefficient, right? Eventually, I'll get so that n squared is so big that no matter how tiny this is, it doesn't matter, right? So when we talk about order notation, we're sort of what, uh, talking about what happens at the limit as we scale this thing. And that's why we care about this part, about what this highest exponent is. That's why that's what we say, n squared. That's why we say that about it, right? But since we are not always at the limit, when we're talking about game programming and practical programming things, the Cs actually matter. And so what happens is if, oh, how many items are you sorting? Well, I don't know. Let's find out, actually. How many items are we sorting? You know? It's not infinity, I'll give you a hint. 
Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, break there on that guy. Sort entries. Sort entries. Let's go ahead and run there. Uh, here's a typical call to sort entries. This is probably rendering our cutscene. And count is one. Okay, great. So that's that. That's one. What's count now? Let's see here. Also one. Can we ever get more than one? 79. There we go. Looks like 80 is somewhere around where we're at. Let's try running the game. This is the cutscene. Let's see where that's at. Count is 100. Count is 160. Yeah. So what we're talking about here is it's not that large, right? It's 160. That's the number. So what that means is that 160, well, you know, what's 160 squared? All right. 25,000. Anyone here think that a computer has trouble processing 25,000 things? No. So one of the problems that we're faced with very frequently when we're dealing with actual uh, practical usage of these things is we may be below the point where the numbers are growing large enough to start ignoring what the C's are or even caring what the C's are. So it may be, for example, one common thing is that let's say we have something that's n squared and something that's n. But the number of things we're doing is so low that these values don't actually um, come out to be very large, right? So maybe our n squared is 25,000. Right? So we have one thing that would do something 160 times and one thing that would do it 25,000 times. Right? Those would be the two algorithms. This is algorithm A, this is algorithm B. They both do the same thing. One's O n squared, one's O n. We know that this will do 160, this does uh, 25,000. Well, how much slower would each uh, operation in B have to be in order for it to be as slow as A? Well, we already know. It's doing 160 things, so if it was 160 times slower, that would be enough, right? Well, what sort of thing is on the magnitude of 160 times slower? A cache miss, right? You will oftentimes wait for hundreds of cycles on a cache miss, depending on the processor. And so, if B was an extremely, extremely cache-unfriendly thing to do, let's say, don't know how, but let's say it was, and A was extremely, extremely cache-friendly, you might see the kind of thing where, for a lot of workloads, A was actually somehow faster, and B was slower. Now, if you crank that number up to, like, 100 billion, all of a sudden, there's no way you're ever going to want to do anything other than run B, because A will take forever. But, if you'd ever do that, all bets are off, right? Furthermore, uh, the other thing that may happen, and I'm going to mention quicksort here pretty soon uh, because it's relevant, is that remember when we talk about on squared uh, versus on, we are talking about worst case, right? We talked about this yesterday. When we say something's on squared, we don't mean that it takes on squared time. We mean that it might take on squared time. It could often only take on time. It could often take o1 time. We have no idea how much time it might take. We just know it won't take more than n squared running time, right? And so what might very well happen is there might be a great algorithm that's on squared, but it almost always performs its work actually in O n time. And so, as the case with sorts, for example, we know that this is quick sort right here. We haven't talked about it yet. Quick sort is an O n squared algorithm, right? Uh, merge sort, the one that I talked about the other day, is actually O uh, log n, well, n log n, right? And we talked about what that means, right? So it's log base 2. So it's the it's 2 to the x equals n solve for x, right? It's, it's, it's what 2 raised to what power equals n. So a very flattening function. No matter how big you make n, this comes out to be a pretty small number because it's log base 2, right? Uh, it's the opposite of how nasty this is. It's like a very good thing. It's, it's sort of reducing our number by a lot. So we have an O uh, log n, uh, n log n, and we have an O n squared. Now, quick sort. Actually, I'm telling you these two sorts 
This one you've seen, this one you haven't seen yet. Quick sort is on squared, merge sort is on log n. However, the C runtime library chose to implement this one. This is the default sort. Now, why on earth would they do that? Why would they make the default sort be n squared when they know full well there is a trivial, I mean, I showed you how easy it was. We did it on the Blackboard, right? A trivial sort that would not have been that way. And the answer is because quick sort most of the time actually doesn't go n squared. Most of the time, quick sort's actually o n. That's its expected running time is not n squared. And it turns out uh, that its expected running time in practice when measured is oftentimes faster than merge sort, at least back in the day when they were running on the kinds of machines uh, that they were using uh, for the C runtime library when that was being developed, right? So that's another thing that can happen, is you can get caught up thinking about the worst case, but the worst case isn't actually the one that you ever hit, or you hit it very rarely and don't care, for example. Now, that sort of thing tends to make me pretty nervous. I don't like knowing that there's some kind of worst case hiding in my thing that might make me explode. But, you know, again, it depends on the app, um, application. It depends on what you're doing. If it's the case um, that it means like one frame out of a billion, you hit a, a stutter, maybe that's fine. Because let's face it, the graphics driver and Adobe Acrobat and whatever other garbage the user has running on their machine, the fucking updater, oops, swore again. The updater for Flash might decide to run right in the middle of your game, and that's tons of lag frames right there. Maybe the fact that sometimes, once in a blue moon, in this rare case, you get just the right input to go O n squared on some algorithm that wasn't that way. Maybe that's fine, right? Uh, but if it's something that's absolutely time critical, and you know that you cannot afford something like that, Maybe it's not such a good decision. And then maybe, even though you know that this will be faster most of the time, maybe you pick this because you don't want to risk having that just perfectly, the stars aligned and I went uh, n squared on my quick sort, right? So that's another thing to be aware of is that when you look at these order notation things, you need to be aware of what they're telling you is the worst thing that could happen. They're not necessarily telling you the average or expected or anything else uh, they're just kind of saying, hey, man, uh, this is what, what could happen in the worst case. All right, uh, so let's talk about some other sorts here uh, just kind of briefly. And I'll talk about some of the ones that, we, um, uh, that have been mentioned, uh, and I'll just briefly sort of say what they are before we get around. I don't know if we'll have time today to really write one because I kind of decided it was, we needed more Blackboard time uh, based because I kind of wanted to talk about some of the stuff that uh, I saw in that, that cool lecture yesterday. All right. Uh, so anyway, let's talk about some sorting algorithms here and, and what they what they do. Uh, so you know that there was the bubble sort. Uh, we talked about that one already. I showed you merge sort, which is just we break the problem down to pieces, sort the pieces, and then merge the pieces together. Uh, so we have bubble sort, we have merge sort, then we've got quick sort, which we haven't talked about yet, but this is the default one uh, in the C runtime library. This is the one that's in the CRT. Uh, so if you actually go and you look at the function qsort, uh, kind of grab it here, you can see this one here. Uh, this one typically is implemented by quicksort. That's why it's called qsort. Now, I don't actually know if it's required to be quicksort. Uh, it may be that the spec allows you to implement whatever you want. Uh, I don't really know. I'm not a specs lawyer kind of a person. Uh, but point being, it's called qsort because that's what it traditionally was. So that's a common one uh, because you'll, you know, you'd see that. Uh, we also have um, in this list one that got mentioned a couple times on the stream, which is radix sort. Uh, and that's kind of a very special kind of odd sort. Uh, and I feel like these are all the ones that got mentioned. Oh, insertion sort was mentioned as well. Uh, and this one, I don't ever, I don't think I've ever done really uh, well, no, you know, maybe, you know, I, I, okay. I think I have done uh, a pseudo insertion sort. I think I have done a pseudo insertion sort. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, something that's sort of like an insertion sort, but I don't think I've ever really done a full insertion sort. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about these. So bubble sort, we know what it was. We said it's O n squared. We've been over that a dozen times now. Hopefully everyone understands why and everyone understands how you implement this, right? You just go through all the items and you just swap any, oops, did that come out? I hope I didn't just uh, ruin my, my uh, plug there. Let me double check that. Disaster, disaster. I did order some longer cables for this. So I'm hoping that, hoping that I won't have this problem anymore once they finally arrive. 
Uh, yeah, okay, I'm still on, that's fine. Uh, so, <clears throat> sorry, back to what I was saying. Uh, so yeah, so bubble sort, we know it's own squared, you just go through all the elements uh, and you keep moving them up if they're supposed to be up or down, if they're supposed to be down. And if you know you do that n times, you know that even if something was all the way at the end, it will be all the way at the top. You have to do n uh, passes over n things, ergo uh, it is uh, n squared. Now the merge sort, uh, we know that it's basically the same thing in terms of, at the low level, we have to do passes over n items every time, but we only have to do uh, log n of them, so it's log n log n, right? This is n passes uh, over n items. And this is log n passes over n items, right? Okay, so quick sort uh, is actually uh, kind of a weird, it's, it's really a pretty weird algorithm. And the reason that I say that quicksort is a pretty weird algorithm is because to me it feels almost like a randomized algorithm. In fact, there are randomized quicksorts but it's not usually discussed in the terms of a randomized algorithm because it's often implemented, I think even the CRT implementation of it uh, is not done randomly. It's not done, it, it's not done with any randomness in some sense. Uh, so how does quicksort work? First, I will tell you that it's on squared and I don't know that we're gonna try and prove that here because some of these things as we go through them, radix sort is probably easy and insertion sort is probably easy um, but quick sort, I don't remember. It may be kind of hard to see why it's n squared um, unless you've got some CS skills. But uh, let's see. So quick sort is sort of a little bit like the merge sort. Uh, it's based on breaking things up. But unlike the merge sort, which does it kind of in a very deterministic way, uh, which breaks it down to like individual pairs and then merges the pairs and up into bigger, bigger uh, elements as it goes, it uses what's called a partition. And so I'm gonna go over here and talk about that. So it just does a partition pass first, right? Well, wow, my handwriting just gets worse and worse. It does what's called a partition. I blame the tablets. I feel like if I was actually writing on a chalkboard or something, it'd be fine. Anyway, it does a partition pass uh, to basically break up things into groups based on how they relate to one particular value in the, in the set of things. So for example, if I have a bunch of stuff in here, five, nine, four, three, one, two, uh, seven, like so. Uh, what a quick sort will do is quick sort will say, all right, I gotta start sorting this. The first thing I'm gonna do is pick what's called a pivot, which is one of the elements, although I guess technically it wouldn't even have to be one of the elements. It's just some number, right? So I'm gonna pick a pivot and I'm gonna break this group up into two smaller groups based on where they land relative to the pivot, right? So maybe I say the pivot in this case is three because that's just what I happen to pick. And so I break this up into things that are less than three um, or less than or equal to depending on how I do it. But let's just say less than three. So in this case, we have one and two. And then I do things that are more than uh, three or equal to, right? Because I need to put the three itself in there somewhere. And so then I would have like, okay, more than or equal to three, it's like, okay, I've got three, four, five, what, seven, nine, right? Uh, <clears throat> so now uh, what you immediately know, right, is that these things always come before these things. So unlike in our merge sort, because you remember our merge sort when we broke it down to pieces, we had no idea what order the pieces came in. That's why we had to, at every step, we had to do a merge. We had to do a merge every time to figure out where things go. But after this partition, we know that the one and two come first and the three, four, five, seven, nine, they come after, right? That makes sense. Um, so you've already figured out part of your sort. You, and you can do this in place, right? You could imagine doing this in place where you just kind of swap things out. Uh, as necessary, right? I could like, I could just go, oh, I got to do less than, uh, you know, and more than three. I can imagine kind of doing it in place or e if I don't want to do it in place for whatever reason, I can do it uh, with just two buffers of the same size, right? And I just kind of write them through. I go, okay, what's less than three? Just put them into their position. Then I go, what's more than three? Put those into their position, right? And then I know that I can just ping pong back and forth between those really easily and things just get more and more sorted, right? 
And so all I have to do to continue down my quick start path, you can kind of see where this is going. I just keep applying that. I pick a pivot again. I say the pivot's two. It's like, oh, wait, actually, probably you wouldn't actually do this. You just go, when you get down to two items, you just swap them if they're not equal, right? So if, if they're in the wrong order. So probably don't have to focus on this one. But point being, when you still have more than two items, you just do the same thing again. Pick another pivot. What's the pivot? Uh, I, maybe I pick seven this time, right? And so then I go, okay, I picked seven for the pivot. I need to do more than uh, seven, less than seven, right? So the less than seven things are going to be three, four, five, and the greater than seven things are going to be seven and nine. This is now done because I, uh, you know, consort it. This one needs to pick a pivot again. So I pick the pivot five maybe, uh, and then I've got just five and three, four. And hey, now my whole thing's sorted, right? And so what you can kind of see about this, hopefully, is you can see why I say that there's like an expected running time of on, um, but a worst case of on squared, right? And the reason is because how long this takes depends on what you pick for the pivot, right? Because if I pick a pivot that splits things fairly well, then I will be able to do this very quickly, right? I will not have to go through very many passes at all. Uh, it, it's actually, wait, sorry, did I say expected ON? That's, that's not right. <laughs> that's, that, that's bad. I believe it would still be uh, N log N. <laughs> I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's expected ON. That's, 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 uh, pretend I didn't say that. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't see how it would be expected ON. It would probably still be expected N log N. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, but worst case n squared. Point being, um, the reason is because if I pick this pivot poorly, I may end up still having to do n steps, right? Let's say every time I picked the highest one. So I pick nine, right? And that means I'm still, I, 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 uh, if I do this this way, so I pick nine, I end up with uh, one, two, three, four, uh, five, seven in one group, and then nine, right? Okay, I pick again, I pick wrong again, I get seven, so I'm one, two, three, four, five, and then seven. I pick wrong again, I pick five, I got one, two, three, four, and five, right? And essentially what you can see is I'm gonna have to go through n steps because I'm only removing one thing. I'm only sorting one element every time. It's just as bad as a bubble sort, right? So the fact that this is expected to be faster the only reason it's expected to be faster is because you assume it would be very, very, very unlikely that no matter how you chose to pick your pivot, that you could somehow manage to pick it that poorly that often, right? What are the chances that if you have 100 items, you will pick wrong every single time? That's a 1 in 100 chance followed by a 1 in 99 chance followed by a 1 in 98 chance, right? You would have to go through this incredibly unusual thing to hit that, that worst n squared case. So most of the time, you'll end up with a pivot that splits it into one third and two thirds, let's say, right? Which is pretty good. So that uh, is, is quicksort. And that is an example, the reason that I decided to describe it here, even though I don't think I've ever written or cared about quicksort myself. Um, the reason that that is so, uh, the reason that I chose to describe it is I wanted to give an example of an algorithm that might be n squared but might not be n squared when you run it. Uh, its worst case is always n squared because we do know exactly how to produce that scenario. You just make sure you feed it the inputs in just the right way so that it picks the wrong values. But the chance of that actually happening in practice, incredibly, incredibly, incredibly slim. Uh, especially because as you get more items, the chances that you can pick wrong that many times in a row just keep going up and up and up, right? Uh, so that's the deal with quicksort. And the thing with quicksort to remember uh, is, again, that pivot picking is the most important thing. And so when you are writing quicksorts, basically there, there's, you, you might almost say, if you know something about how the data might look when it comes in, like for example, you know some really good potential pivots, or you know that it's very evenly distributed the values are. Like, let's say, for example, uh, that you knew that your values had a certain range to them and that they were pretty distributed over that range. That gives you a really easy way to pick those pivots. You know that like 
the the you know halfway between the min and the max value if you knew what those were would be a great pivot because you know that things are evenly spread throughout that range so you know that will split them roughly in half right so if you have a bunch of information about the things that you're sorting and you find that you're it's very important for you to write a good sort quick sort might you might be able to actually guarantee for your data that it won't hit the n squared case and then you know maybe that's a really good algorithm so again even when we say that it's o n squared it might not actually be o n squared for you because you may be able to use specific knowledge that you know about the uh, the values that you're putting in there uh, that would make it so that you could avoid ever hitting the n squared case right uh, and again, that's also a good example of, like I was saying, I was talking about randomized algorithms before. That's kind of a good example of a randomized algorithm uh, in the sense that you could imagine uh, using randomness to ensure that you wouldn't ever get highly correlated uh, things in this list, right? Like if, for example, uh, how am I, what am I trying to say? So here's a perfect example. It's already in Handmade Hero. So let's say uh, that the way that this thing worked was it always just picked uh, the first value in the list as the pivot. That's just what it did, right? Well, uh, if we were to do that, we would pretty much be guaranteed uh, n squared running time for our cutscenes in our sort because we know that our, uh, our cutscenes put things into the render queue in precisely an ordered fashion. The Z's just go up linearly. They go like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? The Z's just go straight up. So whatever, you know, the, the, the lowest Z happens first, the highest Z happens last or whatever, we know that that's always the case. And so uh, it would be like the absolute worst case for this thing. But if instead what you did when you started out is you randomly permuted all the elements uh, in the list and then ran quicksort, then you would know that no matter what the algorithm was outputting, you would always end up with sort of a jumbled version of it. So you could never hit such a reliable worst case that might be coming out of your algorithm. So there are cases where people use randomness to try and uh, decrease the likelihood that some highly correlated algorithm on one end of the pipeline isn't totally messing up your sort on the, on the back end. Now, I don't tend to really love this stuff like that. Because in general, I'm like, well, if you have that information, you should just try to feed that information into your sort, like write another sort, right? But again, if your goal is to write a general purpose sort, maybe you need to do stuff like that. Okay, uh, so let's talk about another sort here. Uh, let's talk about radix sort. Radix sort is an O1 uh, sort. Not really. Uh, people often say, uh, say oh, sorry. Um, that's good, O1 sort. It's actually OKN. Uh, I don't know why I said brain is going a little bit um, obviously it has to visit all the items that's that's a that's a, a non-issue uh, but it's got an extra kind of weird thing in here so let me talk about this uh, let me talk about this for a minute because it's kind of uh, uh, it's kind of like the traveling salesman thing where I said you're introducing this other thing radix sort introduces another thing so how does a radix sort work uh, a radix sort basically says well you know this is a computer and the chances that I'm sorting on something that is truly arbitrary, right, is actually somewhat low. Now, there's plenty of times that we do sort on arbitrary things. You could imagine like a SQL query that has to sort things. There's often complex stuff that it's trying to sort on or whatever. Rake sort, not going to help you there. But a lot of times we're sorting on things uh, that are like, you know, it's a 32-bit int, right? And we know that no matter what value we could dream up, we're storing it in a 32-bit int, so it ain't never going to be bigger than 4 billion, right? That's just, that's just the truth. So, uh, radix sort is about exploiting the fact that even though we're talking about very specific numbers uh, that in our imagination are arbitrary, in practice in the computer, most of the time the stuff that we're computing with isn't really arbitrary because it's got to fit in something the CPU actually works with. So radix sort uh, does sorting based on a direct look at the uh, values that it's sorting, the sort key that it's sorting, and it assumes that they are a fixed size. And this K uh, that's in here is that size. So a radix sort is actually has two different uh, sort of things that affect its running time. It's the number of digits, right, or bits, I should say, like the bit count, right? 
uh, and then there's the the uh, I shouldn't say bit count. Um, this is again if you if you want to be a little more CSE, it's really just I'm gonna say digit count, I guess, because the rate of sort I think conceptually is more about whatever you consider a digit to be, and maybe you want that to be binary, or maybe you want that to be um, uh, you know it. Uh, uh, eight bit or whatever, because when you actually go to implement uh, the radix sort, you could you could do it. You could choose to to chunk those things up in in different ways, right? Uh, okay, so the radix sort has a dependency on the digits, and it has a dependency on the the number of items. So how many things that you're going to sort, and the way that it works is basically by peeling. And I think we're out of time, so maybe we'll yeah we'll talk about uh, how it works in detail more tomorrow. But it basically works by peeling. It says, well, I know that I've only got 32 bits worth of possible things and I right if I'm sorting the set of all 32 bit integers even you know every single possible 32 bit integer was in the set I know that I could basically talk about 32 different um, uh, sort of uh, categorizers if you will uh, of where things would fall in the final result right uh, conceptually speaking you could just think of it as saying well um, I know that I've got this 32-bit value, and I know that this bit here, right, is going to be, um, I, let me take the high bit first, so assuming that we're sorting uh, high bit first. I know that this bit here, right, uh, anything with this bit set is going to come after so anything that, that doesn't have this bit set, right? So right off the bat, I can partition my, my things into two halves, stuff that does have that bit set, stuff that doesn't have that bit set, right? Then I could do the exact same thing to those partitions uh, using the second bit, right? And then partition those into things that do and don't have that bit set and don't do and don't have that bit set, right? And if I just do that 32 times, if I just did that 32 times going down it, I would have my complete thing sorted, right? Because I can just do literally just a binary split each time. And then by the time I get to the 30 second pass, everything's sorted. Uh, and so that's why it changes it into something that does not actually require even n log n operations. There's no log n in here, right? It's only k times n, where k is the number of those uh, sort of like discriminators that you're going to do, right? And sort of the reason that I said it, it's not clear what this actually means is because it's sort of up to the implementer how they might want to break things up, right? And so you might want to break them up into bigger values than just per bit because, you know, maybe it's, it's more efficient to, to break things into more than that number of buckets. Now, this does require space. You can't do these in place. At least I don't know of any way to do them in place. I don't study sorting, so maybe there is. But uh, so this requires extra space. But, um, you know, usually that's not such a big problem. Uh, and then finally, we've got insertion sort. Insertion sort, and again, we'll talk about this one tomorrow. Uh, we'll probably implement, maybe we'll implement this and this. That seems like a pretty good thing. Uh, people seem to be very excited about that. So maybe we'll implement these two. Uh, and of course, we already have this one. I'm not going to implement this one because I don't really care about it. And I'm not going to implement this one because it's not that useful. But I'll just briefly say, I believe insertion sort, assuming that I remember that one, uh, is on squared and the reason is because the way it works is it just says well you know what I'll just take the things here are my items right I'll just take them and I'll make a thing that I'm gonna put them in or whatever and I'll say like okay I go with the first one and I just stick it in the first slot right so you know I got a and a goes here I take the next one and I just go should it go in the first you know what is this relationship to a if it's less than a I move a up one and I put myself in its place uh, if it's not, then I just go to the next one, right? In which case I put B here. So the reason this gets slower is because as I go, right, uh, I have to move all of these things out of the way. And even if I didn't, even if it's a linked list or something, I still have to potentially visit all the items for every insertion, which is N squared again, right? So even if I assume that I have some easy way uh, of, of, I don't have to actually copy everything out, uh, it's still N squared because just looking at everything, I might have to do that uh, n times for every insertion, right? Uh, so insertion sort, not particularly interesting, but the reason that I said sometimes I do a pseudo insertion sort is because I do find this sort of a thing very handy if I just want like top n, right? So let's say that I, I don't care about sorting. 
I just want to know, like, I've got a thousand items, right? And I want to know what the highest four are, right? Um, so what are the highest four in this thing? Well, I might make a little thing that just has four entries and I just do exactly an insertion sort on it because I know that that'll be really, really fast to just go through here and go like, uh, okay, for each item, I just do N pass through. And so then it becomes an O four times N, right? Or just O N algorithm. So just go through all the items, look at this little side table that's got, you know, four entries in it, right? And I just go like, okay, is this item greater than this one? Is it greater than this one? Is it greater than this one? Is it greater than this one, right? And when I find one that's greater than, I just move everything down, right? Uh, and one falls off the end and I stick it in. And that's all really fast operations because we're just talking about a few bytes of memory uh, that you just kind of romp around in there, right? So that's a place where I do use insertion sort. The reason I call that an if pseudo insertion sort is because I never use it to actually sort all the items. I just use it if I'm trying to find the top N. So, yeah, not really an insertion sort. Uh, all right, with that, let's go to the Q&A. I think that wraps up pretty much everything that I want to say about order notation, because again, not my area of expertise. Don't really have much uh, to add uh, about it in general. Uh, I think that's all the information that we'll need for Handmade Hero uh, at all. Uh, and tomorrow we'll just <coughs> implement uh, the two, those two sorts there, Merge and Radix, uh, so you can actually see how they work. All right, Q and A. Uh, Snowy Crystal Z, so why would you not always do radix sort with a sort um, of just whatever the size of the type is? Uh, okay, so there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, let me just let me just sort of give you uh, let me just sort of give you an example. Um, so okay, what did I say? I said that we can always do sort in n log n time, right? We know that that's uh, what we can do, and I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, CS guys on this, but I believe that this is actually proven, meaning this is the proven lower bound. Uh, I think somebody actually just demonstrated flat out math wise that there will never be an ON sort. It's not possible. Uh, it just does not exist. So if you're talking about general sorting, there is no way to actually do better than this. But we know we always can uh, because you could use a merge sort, for example, and you know that that will do that, right? Um, I think there are other ones. I don't know if we keep sort. I th that there's there's more than one. There are multiple sort algorithms that will always do that. And so the thing is, well, how many items are you sorting, right? Uh, you know, if you are sorting, um, uh, in fact, you could almost do this math wise. A radix sort, I just said, takes k n time, right? Where this is the number of like bucket things that you're, that you're using for it, that's like how many it's gonna take. Well, if we look at these two here, the question you could ask, would be when is this value worse than this value? And the answer is they have, both have the n, so you're just talking about comparing k, right, uh, to log n. If log n is actually smaller than k, right, if, if that's, you know, if that's actually smaller, then this is probably not such a win, right? Uh, and this might be the case because Oftentimes, you know, let's say I'm sorting, you know, maybe I'm sorting a million items or something like this, or let's make it easier on ourselves and say that we're uh, sorting, you know, 60, uh, 64,000, right? So we know that log n is, is like 16 or something, right? Uh, then you're going to say, well, you know, if it's 16, then this k, you know, uh, how many things that we're going to sort, this k was like 32. Is that such a good idea, right? But maybe it's smaller than that. Maybe I'm doing it in bigger buckets. So maybe it's more like four or five right, something like that, right? Well, that's fine, right? That's totally fine. But that only, that will only be true as long as the thing that you're sorting on, the sort key is very small, right? It's gotta be something like a 16-bit integer, right? 32-bit integer, it's gotta be something like that. If I had a giant type like you were suggesting, let's say I had a type that was like 256 bytes, you know, long, 
Well, now suddenly k is almost always going to be bigger than log n. It's going to be much bigger than log n, right? Log n might be something only like 16 or like 20 or even 32. If we were sorting 4 billion items, it would only be 32, right? Whereas this k is now massive. No matter what you were doing with this, it's 256 bytes long. That means this k is, a, is probably 256. It could be maybe, maybe it's 128. Maybe it's um, even as low as 64 or something. Maybe, depending on how you were bucketing these things and how much memory you chose to use. But man, right? That's starting to get pretty brutal. It's actually you're doing twice the amount of work, four times the amount of work, a considerably more amount of work um, on this sort, right? So that's the first reason, is because k and log n do not always compare favorably. A lot of times they do, and the k is better, maybe, uh, but a lot of times they don't. Uh, and so that's one thing, right? Uh, the other thing is you, it may be uh, impossible, right? Uh, so it may be like uh, impossible uh, to make the key, right? Uh, and so if I'm going to sort on things, it may be that I need to compute something that happens between these two things that is not representable as a, as a, a quantity. Now, I know that sounds a little weird and you're like, what are you talking about? Um, well, let's say we were trying to sort based on uh, uh, the, the Euclidean distance between two things. So I've got, uh, this is the thing that I'm sorting. I'm sorting an entity, right? And my entity has a V3 in it that's the location. Where is that thing, right? And so I want to sort these entities and I want to sort them based on how far away they are uh, like from each other or, or something like this, right? Let's see if this is, I don't even know if this is actually all that legal. I could make it into a total ordering by doing some things, but... Uh, that would require me to talk about this, but okay. So partial ordering and total ordering. This gets into some sorting stuff. I don't know if, maybe we'll talk about this, maybe we won't. But point being, let's say that the thing that I want to sort on was actually a function, and it was a function of the two things. So I'm gonna sort on something that's like, you know, I, I want to know, you know, distance between entity A and entity B, right? And that's gonna be like AP minus BP, right? And it's gonna be whatever that, that length is, right? And that's gonna be, um, uh, well, I guess I'm not sure exactly how I could make, turn this into a sort. I have to turn this into something uh, sorty, because uh, the length is always gonna be positive, so I need something. I need a, a, I need a way of using, you have to just trust me that these things exist if I can't think of it. Just give me another second. I'll, I'll think of a better example because that, that won't give me a value that I can sort on. Um, uh, how about... How about a string? Okay, uh, so I've got an entity and it has a name. The name is arbitrarily long. So it can be, you know, I don't know, 256 bytes. We have no idea, right? And now I tell you I want to sort these entities by their name so that they're in alphabetical order or something like this. Uh, now I'm like, well, okay. For the rest of all of these sorts, right, for all the other sorts, all they have to do is compare two items, which means it does not matter how long those strings are, they just work. And they'll compare the two strings and off you go. Radix sort needs the sort key to be a fixed length, which means that the only way you could possibly turn it into a Radix sort is you'd first have to go through every single entity and you'd have to look at how long the name was, right? And then you'd have to make your sort key be that many bits, however you know uh, many bytes uh, that thing is. You'd have to make it be uh, you know uh, however many bits long the longest name was. That's how big your sort key would have to be. And then you'd have to actually uh, do the radix sort on that giant thing, right? 
And so that right there is a good example of how it's, it may not even be all that feasible even to just set up the radix sort because even to just know how big the key is, you would have to do a pass over all the data just to find that out, right? Whereas all the rest of the people, they don't care at all about that. Furthermore, you could invent kind of really strange things in here, which is let's suppose that our sort order actually takes into account uh, some kind of cross string behavior that might happen. So for example, maybe I say something like, oh, I've got like Dave um, um, Bauer or something, right? Is one of my strings and like Carl um, Worthington is one of my entities, right? And, um, and then there's like, um, let's say uh, uh, big tuna. All right, so here are some strings. With all of the other sort functions, it would be free for me to introduce weird cross strings that thing, cross string things that happen. I could say something like, they appear in alphabetical order, except for if the name Carl is being compared to the name Dave, and if it is, I want to switch the order. So all Carls always appear before all Daves, but otherwise everything is in alphabetical order, right? Now I would have to do a thing where like, I have to pre-process if you even can. I mean, you could come up with things that are pretty crazy here that maybe, I'm trying to think if you can always pre-process or not. I'd have to do some weird thing to like pre-process the names to make sure that the, the bit value I end up using for the sort key for the radix is always the right thing in that case or other stuff like that, right? Whereas in the other cases, in the comparison function, when I do, you know, I write my comparison function for the sort, all I just do is say like, oh, well, if it's like a Dave, you know, if it's a Dave and a Carl, you know, do this one branch, else do this other branch, and it's free, right? I don't have to think at all, I don't have to do anything, it just works. So I can throw special case stuff, I can throw variable length stuff, everything just works with all the other sorts. Radix sorts, none of it works. Radix sorts, you have to do all this work to turn things into strings of bits first, and then you can do it, right? Uh, and so that's another reason why you wouldn't want to use a radix sort is because it's very difficult to turn things into radix sorts if they have complexity in them. Uh, let's see here. Where am I at on cues? Uh, any news on potential Pat Wyatt guest stream? Uh, stay tuned on that. Did you mention sort stability at all? I did not. Um, so sort stability, that's pretty easy to, to talk about. So I'll talk about that. Um, so sort stability just means that if I am going to take some input, right? And the input looks like uh, A, B, C, A, D, E, F or something like this, right? Uh, imagine I have this and I say I want this sorted. Well, all of the sorts will always give you back uh, A, A, B, C, D, E, F, okay? So every single sort that we're gonna use would do this for you, no problem. But the question is, which order do the A's come in? Let's suppose there was something not in the sort key that's stored over here. Right? So I have, for each one of these elements, I have some number associated with them. 5, 9, 2, 3, 1, 7, 8. Right? So the question is, well, for all these other guys, I don't care because I know that they're going to come out in what, in, there's only one order they can come out in, B, C, D, E, F. Right? So I know this is going to be the, the B that had the 9 in it. This is going to be the C with the 2. This is going to be the D with the 1. This is going to be the E that had the 7. This is going to be the F that had the 8. Right? But what order do the A's come out in? Well, that is what sort stability is. If a sort is considered stable, what it means is that the A's will come out in the same order in which you put them in, or at least in a predictable order, right? Maybe you could argue that one that had them came out backwards was still stable because you know they always come out backwards. But point being, stable generally means they come out in the same order you put them in. So the A5 comes out first and the A3 comes out second. Okay? If a sort is not stable, that means that they could come out in any order. We don't know. 
Maybe the eight comes, three comes first, maybe the five comes first. We are not guaranteeing anything. Very, very simple concept. First question you probably have, why would you care? And the answer why you care is because sometimes you want to sort by more than one thing uh, sort of in waves, right? So for example, I might want to do something, you, you ever see this where you go like, oh, um, you know, somebody gave me uh, this thing, right? And it's like, oh, it's like, here's the name and here's the like date um, and here's the like, you know, quantity of tuna. Right? Uh, and like this is in Windows Explorer. And so like then I've got all these things where it's like, oh, here's like my foo.txt and that was made on like July 9th, you know, and it has like two tons of tuna in it, right? Uh, and blah, 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 right? Well, you might want to go like sort these by name. Like give me the, 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 the sort by name, right? And you're like, well, it doesn't matter. Whatever sort we do, it'll sort by name, it's fine, right? Uh, but then we maybe we want to do like sort by date. I click on sort by date and it's like, okay, we sort by date and I notice like there's a couple things here that have July 9th, right? Kind of weird, right? There's a couple things here July, July 9th. So I want to see on July 9th, what had the highest quantity of tuna? Well, if I've got a stable sort, right, I can do stuff like say, oh, well, sort by the quantity of tuna first and then sort by the date or sort by the date and then the quantity of tuna and know that it will leave my original sort, right, items will come in the same order that they used to come in. So for, to answer the question that I gave as an example, if I sort first by quantity of tuna, I know that all of my things go in descending order of tuna. Then I could just go click on sort by date and it would bring the July 9th all together and I would know that it would always be descending. Because they started out, I had, I had pre-sorted my list for quantity of tuna. I click on date and I know it's stable. So it will never rearrange these up to put the zero first when I do my date sort, right? It will keep them the same. And so sometimes being able to like sort by one thing and then sort by another thing and know that the first sort will now take precedence anytime uh, I have equivalent values in my second sort is kind of handy, right? Um, so in this case here, it's like, let's say this sort was important. I sorted this on something else before. And so this value and this value, I, I want to know the fact that this one was the lesser of the two for some other sort. And then I run this sort, I want to preserve that order so I know that I'm going to encounter these in that proper order that I tried to prepare over here. Uh, I won't get that if the sort's not stable. Not a huge deal. To be honest with you, I can't think of a time I've ever cared about stable sorting. Doesn't mean you don't care, just means I don't usually care. Uh, Miblo, what else, if anything, do you think we'll need to sort besides the sprites? I don't know. Uh, it's possible that there'll be one or two other things. It's possible that the sprites will be the only thing. Cuber Caleb, could we possibly generate hint the ground chunks in such a way that using radix sort would be more optimal? Um, I'm pretty sure that actually uh, radix sort Mary sort might well be optimal just in general for what we're doing, uh, but it's hard to say. Kronos, yes, it is proven, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I assume the thing you're saying that was response to uh, was, was the fact that I was saying that O n log n uh, is the fastest that sorts will ever be, uh, meaning that there is no such thing as a sort of general data uh, that can go below n log n. Long boolean, is shell sort basically bubble sort with a variable span between values being compared? Uh, yes, as far as I remember. Um, my recollection of shell sort, which I believe is named after someone named shell. 
I don't know if that's true. I don't know why it's called a shell sort. I'll be completely honest with you. I don't, I don't remember why it's called a shell sort. It just is. Uh, my understanding is shell sort is exactly the same as bubble sort. It's just you compare sort of a different span. So you go like, oh, okay, you know, here's my items. And normally in bubble sort, I compare these two, then 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 I compare these two, right? That's a bubble sort. And I do that in, until the list is sorted. I just keep doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it to list is sorted. A shell sort says, yeah, you know what? Um, let's not do that. Let's do like, first we'll do like this, you know, do elements that are that far away from each other or something, right? And then maybe we'll do elements that are, that are less, right? And I feel like there's like a whole family of shell sorts and they're based on how you choose on which passes, which distances, you know? Um, and the idea is, hey, you could move, if there's things at the bottom that really should be towards the top, those first passes, like, get them up there, right? And so I feel like shell sorts are generally about, uh, to, basically, they're, the idea is tune a bubble sort so that the kinds of data that you're getting actually takes very few of those passes to, to bubble up to the right place. Um, and you can imagine that working, right? If you know kind of how your data might, might come out, you can probably design some shell passes that will have it. Take this with a grain of salt, because uh, I don't remember. That may have a totally inaccurate explanation of shell sort, but that's what I remember it being. Mr. Slick 1015, is this cross-platform yet? Um, depends what you mean. I, as I said many times on the stream, I, it will not be cross-platform until we're done with it, uh, because I won't be doing streams for other platforms till we finish uh, the game on one platform. But other people have done ports, so there's an SDL port of it uh, if you want to use the SDL port of it. Um, so it's cross-platform in the sense that other people have uh, posted the code on the, on, the Git, um, on the GitHub that you get when you pre-order the game or whatever. There's an SDL port up there that people did, and I, don't, I haven't looked at it, but I assume it's up to date. I'm not sure. Dragonkin02, would something like a pivot table be a sort problem or something else altogether? Is that more a sort amalgamation summarization? I'm sorry, I don't really know what a pivot table is. I know there's something in like Excel or something, um, but I, I've never used one. Elvin, off topic, which more do you like? The fixed function API of OpenGL or the programmable one? I've been using the modern approach, but reading examples from the fixed pipeline, they seem to be a lot more intuitive and easier to understand the flow of things. Um, I prefer the prog programmable one, uh, but I wish that it had been better uh, designed at this point. Uh, it's kind of all smushed together now because it went through so many like baby steps to get to where it went. It's kind of, you know. Uh, Snowy Crystals. So by your description, is a stable sort resource intensive? Since it seems like it could be uh, max n squared n log n depending on sort type since you have to run through the data twice. Uh, no, um, so really all that matters, like for example, uh, I, think, I think you could do like a stable merge sort, right? Because you're only reversing elements when you have to. Uh, and so like for example, I feel like you could do a, a stable merge sort just fine and it's o n log n, right? Because all that matters uh, in fact, let's let's double check. I mean, you know, this is this is known. Merge sort stable. Uh, yeah. So most implementations produce a stable sort uh, because you know when you're going through the elements, if the way that the sort is set up makes it easy for you to just copy the things in the order they happened in the original thing when you don't detect a switch, then it's stable. I I feel like bubble sort would also be stable, and it's only n squared. Right? Um. Uh, let's see. Nurad91, when will you stop teasing us with the interactive fiction post and get to the details? 
What details are you talking about? Insofar as, will you leave in some bugs for speedrunners to break the game with? Uh, pff, well, you don't leave in bugs for speedrunners to break the game with. You just, you just have bugs. I mean, what are the chances that we're going to make this whole game and not have any bugs in it? Right? Like, you always have bugs. And so we don't need to leave them in. We'll just, we'll just have, there'll just be some and they'll find them. And then it will be fun or funny to watch. Dragon Kino 2 with a sword. Is this actually adjusting and rewriting the data on the disk, or would it just be in using? Uh, would it just be updating indexes or pointers? Just once you sort, could you read start to finish, or is it pointer intensive? Read ten records, jump. Read next five, jump. Well, it depends what you're doing, right? In our case, we're just sorting in memory, and you can see right here, all we do is just swap the stuff in place. But if you wanted to, you could do it in a different way. You could do it with a, a reference table, and in fact, you could almost actually, to be honest, we're already sort of doing it with with a reference table, right? Because what we sort is not the actual things. We just sort uh, the addresses of the things. So we sort by the sort key and we remember what the addresses are and then we just go grab those addresses. So we're already kind of using one level of indirection to avoid having to copy things around when we do our sort. Uh, Nurad91. It says, I mean how you actually went about solving the problems. It seems so close for weeks, then cliffhanger. <laughs> so I hate to disappoint you, but we're not going to talk about the solutions. Uh, all, the all the Molly Rocket code is proprietary. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Like, we don't post that. Uh, so, like, our engine will be proprietary, and it will not be discussed how it works. Uh, so the posts uh, on the current one are for players mostly. They're just talking about why we thought there were problems and which problems it is that we are solving, if that makes sense. Um, and there'll be, then there'll be a game announcement on there that, that talks about the game and, uh, and that sort of stuff. But we don't, that's not a programming blog and there's not gonna be any discussion of the programming on there. So I can save you the trouble uh, if you're expecting that. Um, there's, there's, not gonna be, uh, there's not gonna be any programming discussions on the Molly Rocket blog. Uh, Snowy Crystals, I read a post the other day that said syntax coloring is bad for programming practices and it enforces skimming rather than understanding. Do you agree or not? Uh, I feel like that's a pretty, that's got to be a pretty data free. I mean, that's just obviously a random statement. I mean, how could anyone have proven such a thing? Um, so that sounds kind of arbitrary to me. Uh, but I guess on the other hand, what I will say is I turn a lot of it off. Like you can notice that I generally don't syntax highlight very much. So I guess for my taste, I don't tend to like that much of it. Um, but that may just be because I don't love the way that syntax highlighters tend to highlight things. I don't know. Um, so I would say it probably depends on the person. Uh, that makes sense. No rad 91 now I know that I have to buy a game to find out. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, you won't have to buy the game to find out because uh, the, the game won't say how it's programmed either. And on the blog, we will talk about like what the game does that's interesting and, and there'll be gameplay videos and stuff like that. So obviously, like we'll talk about which problems we feel like we solved and how well we solved them, if that makes sense. Uh, but we just won't be talking about how we solve them, meaning the, the actual implementation will not be public. Let's see, uh, any cues? Any other cues? I think we're done with Q&A anyway, so it's probably good that there are no more cues because that means we can wrap it up. All right, 
it looks like that's about it on the questions, if that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and, and wind down. Uh, thank you very much for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. Uh, we will be back to programming tomorrow because I think we have now gotten through everything that there is to say um, from my perspective on error notation because that's, like I said, all I know. I am not a CS person, so you know as much as I do about error notation now, which is not very much, but it's the amount that I think you should know uh, if you are someone who does game programming because I feel like you should be aware of, of what the complexity is of the algorithms that you choose. And so now that we're done with that, tomorrow we can implement some of those sorts and uh, yeah, and then we will be done with sorting because there really isn't that much to it and it's not that big of a deal uh, for games most of the time. Sorts are not really that important. Uh, and so really I just wanted to go over it as an introduction order notation because we talk about it a lot and I mention order notation uh, on Handmade Hero so far. Sorting is kind of a very classic one. There's a lot of literature on it, so it's just a good place to kind of sneak in. Uh, up time to talk about, hey, there's a whole field here, and there's all these things to know about if you care. Uh, and so that's what we did. So we'll implement it tomorrow, and that'll be the end of our sorting. We'll move on to some other stuff. Uh, that is it for now. Uh, if you would like uh, to follow along at home with the coding tomorrow, you can always pre-order the game. It comes with the source code on handmadehero.org. You can also go to our forum site uh, and ask questions if you have follow-up questions. Uh, you can subscribe to our Patreon if you want to support the video series. And you can also look at our Tweetbot to find out when we are broadcasting live. And that, of course, is known for tomorrow, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I'll be right back here for the last stream of the week, the Friday stream. Uh, and uh, then the Tweetbot will, of course, after that, tell you when we will be live next week. Uh, that's it for today. Thanks everyone for joining me and I will catch you guys on the internet and hopefully tomorrow at, at 5 p.m. Uh, for our sorting. Take it easy everyone.